Okay, I'm gonna run through a little bit of information just for. Okay. You can look at me. All right. <laughs> for the Library of Congress. The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. Your name? Uh, chief, what full name? Yes, sir. John R. Allen, Jr. Birthday? 17 October 1935. Okay, and what did you serve in, Mr. Allen, or General Allen? Uh, in the Air Force. And achieved the rank of? Brigadier General. We are recording on November 9th, 2012 in Seneca, South Carolina. I am Anna Hickey, and I am conducting the interview, and there's no relation. <laughs> okay. Okay, General Allen, where did you grow up? Yeah, I'm sorry. Where did you grow up? Well, uh, I grew up really in several... My father was with the Department of Agriculture, and it was like being in the Air Force. We moved every three years. So, uh, but so we finally anchored in Spartanburg in 1949, and I graduated from high school over there. And uh, since that time, I haven't been back there very much, but... Okay, so you weren't, well, you were born in Louisville, but you didn't live there no, too long. No, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And then how did you get interested in the Air Force? Always wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Spartanburg, we lived out near at the uh, airport, the old airport. Yeah. And uh, I just wandered around when I was in high school, got to know some people, finally ended up doing a little work on some airplanes, polishing them, cleaning them, and whatnot. They gave me flying lessons. For free? Yeah, for doing it. So that was great. And I loved doing that. That's how I got started flying. Okay. And then you, did you have a college education? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And it's, it's the uh, University of Nebraska uh, at Omaha. <clears throat> and later on, I have a master's degree from Central Michigan. Okay. So what brought you off to Nebraska? Well, that was where I was stationed. Okay. Uh, I got... I went, to, this is a personal story, all okay. right? Uh, I went to college at the University of Louisville on a Navy ROTC scholarship. On one of our cruises that we took for, uh, for our normal summer cruises, uh, I had some pretty close contact with the uh, Navy flying on the aircraft carrier. And the light carrier, and uh, this, you know, we're talking about 1954, we're not talking about catapults and jets, right. and I finally decided I didn't like those short runways. <laughs> and, and so with that, at the end of my second year in college, uh, I applied for and was uh, taken into the aviation cadet program. They don't have that anymore now. And uh, to learn to fly and finished my degree later on. Okay. And, uh, and I was stationed at SAC headquarters at Omaha when I finished my degree, and then at the Pentagon later on when I finished a uh, master's degree. And how old were you when you were in Nebraska? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I have to think about that. I was a major at the time, so 35. Okay. Yeah. So when did you first decide that you were going to enlist or in the, in the Air Force? I knew that I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. And well, since I was on a Navy ROTC scholarship, my thoughts were, well, I'll fly with Navy. And as, you know, as I told you, I said I didn't care much for that kind of flying. Yeah. So uh, that was when I decided to go uh, into the Aviation Cadet Program and uh, came out of that uh, just fine. Now, I had to go directly from college into the Aviation Cadet Program because if I had not had gone home, my father would have killed me because <laughs> I just gave up a full scholarship with a hundred dollars a month payment <laughs> to go play with airplanes. <laughs> okay, so how did you even get a scholarship? Uh, at in high school, there uh, and I, I think they essentially still do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You go through a testing process mm -hmm. and uh, and are selected out of that Spartanburg High School. We had, oh, as I recall. There were four of us, I think, that got scholarships, so, uh, all of the Navy. So when the Vietnam War started, <laughs> how old were you? Well, the Vietnam War kind of started for me, you know, in uh, 19, uh, what? Ten, it finished up in 70, 60, and 68, because that's the first time that I went over there. 
and uh -huh. I was in the B-52s at the time, had a crew. And we went over there at that time and three months, another time for three months, and another time for six months. So what was training like when you knew that you would possibly be going over to Vietnam? Yeah. How did you train? Well, it was, uh, it, it was quite, quite a bit different because in the B-52 world in those days, our primary mission was nuclear. And we pulled nuclear alert, and that's the way we were tested, the way we were taught to learn. Now, all of a sudden, now we're going to go out and bomb conventionally in a completely different environment. So we had to go through a different training program. At the time, I was stationed at Carswell Air Force Base, and the training program we went to to go over there was at Castle Air Force Base in uh, California, uh, which is closed now. But uh, that's where we got our primary training for that mission. Then we came back, we would have to convert back to our nuclear mission again, and okay. did that three times. So when you decided, or when you knew that you were going to go to Vietnam, what did your family think? Well, uh, well, you know, nobody was very happy about right. it, except for me. I got kind of tickled because my crew came to me one day when we were on alert and said, you know, this Vietnam thing is going to get over pretty quick. This is 1968. <laughs> it says, you know, we probably need a volunteer if we're going to get involved in it, you know, or it's going to pass us by. I said, well, all right. So, you know, I went in and volunteered for it, and then a year later as we got through with all the assignments, I said, okay, guys, <laughs> I don't think we really needed to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you were okay with the U.S. deciding to get involved in Vietnam? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we did. Right. You know, so, uh, yeah, we want to go be a part of that. So when you, what was like, what was it like when you were flying to Vietnam? Were you with guys that you knew or just yeah, completely? Yeah, my crew. Okay. Yeah. And at this point, what was your rank? Well, let's see. I started out over there as a uh, captain on my first tour. And then uh, my next two tours, I was a major. Okay. So the first time you were in Vietnam, uh -huh. um, how long were you there for? Three months? Three months. And what did you do over there? Well, our combat missions that we flew were... Um, Initially, we were out of Guam, and then the second time we flew to Guam, and then we went over to uh, to uh, uh, to where Okinawa, and flew missions out of Okinawa, and then our final tour we did we flew out of Utapao, Thailand. Okay. And so the three primary bases for B-52s that we flew missions. And what were your living conditions like over there? What was our your living conditions? Uh, <coughs> kind of like barracks. Uh, a couple of them, it's sort, of, sort of like, I, I guess you kind of compare it to a motel. Mm -hmm. You know, individual rooms, two people per room. That's pretty, that's not Sharing bad. a bath, something like that. Yeah, so it was bearable? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, were you married at this point? Was I? Married? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how did you keep, did you write letters? Did I? Write letters? Yeah, we did, and at the time, uh, we would send, uh, I would send tapes, so small video tapes, or audio tapes back, and uh, other than that, letters, yeah. How do you record on the audio? Uh, sometimes I took it along, and my electronic warfare officer, who's good at that kind of stuff, would uh -huh. plug it into the communication system in the bomber, and uh, you know, so we could fly and they could actually hear what we were doing on our missions, how it would work. Oh, wow. So what was the food like? What do you guys eat? Like, I don't know, what was a normal day of food like? Well, uh, you know, we weren't, uh, we weren't in the field in our business, you know, that, like, uh, like the Army, we didn't have K rations or anything like that at the time. And as a matter of fact, uh, we had uh, pretty good mess halls. Uh, the, we were in Thailand, we lived in uh, trailers. Uh, they were air-conditioned trailers, so I know my, my father-in-law, who traipsed up and down uh, in the infantry, traipsed up and down to Italy mm -hmm. a couple of times like this, used to just have a fit when he found out, you know, I'm over here fighting a war, living in an air-conditioned trailer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying, that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, the, the food was, uh, w was pretty normal, really. And then you said you lived with your crew, mostly. Yeah. Um, were these men from all over the United States, or yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. And you guys, you guys, pretty, did you go pretty close to them? Uh, yeah, we did. As a matter of fact, there's uh, several of them I still keep track of. 
Really? Right now, my co-pilot from back in those days now, he and I still email back and forth, and we see each other at a few reunions, and uh, okay. we keep track of each other. So what are the reunions like? Uh, there are, most of them are squadron reunions, uh, bomb squadron reunions, and uh, we go, uh, uh, our primary one that we did was out of Carswell at Fort Worth, and a combination of Fort Worth and Barksdale at Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay. And uh, we just go there, it's just all the people were in the squadron. Some of them came after we left, and so you meet new people as well, and uh, uh, a lot of storytelling. Yeah, so when you weren't actually fighting, was there a lot of downtime? When we... When you weren't? Well, it, it, it sort of depended on what was going on. We could get out uh, at Utapala in particular, there was a Padilla Beach, uh, which is still a resort area like this. We used to go there and do, do sailboarding. And uh, you could go into Bangkok, you know, that I, I never cared a whole lot for that. My crew did. They went mm -hmm. to Bangkok a lot. But uh, I usually uh, stayed back, read books, mm -hmm. whatever. So talking about the battle specifically, you said you were in linebacker? How, how do you yeah. pronounce that? Yeah, linebacker. Okay. It what was, was that Linebacker like? 1, linebacker 2. Those, those were major offenses, offensive operations that we did against the Viet Cong. And... Uh, you know, they were designed with everybody lined up and ready to go. And and when it went out, it went out with just with the infantry as well as Marines. The Navy was involved. I mean, it was a whole operation. And we would be a part of that operation, and that was a linebacker. Now, the arc light that I talked about, the arc light was the overall program for B-52s in Vietnam. And, and we had other B-52 bases that were involved with that as well. So... Uh, it's quite quite a mixture of people when you finally got over there in the B-52s. Oh yeah. So were you with the South Vietnamese at all? Was I? Were you with the Southern, the South Vietnamese soldiers as well too? No, no. I I, I did not actually get into South Vietnam myself. Uh, I uh, or the portion of I bombed it a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could tell you a lot about it, <laughs> but other than that, I was not on the ground there. So when you were flying, um, what was it like in the air? Were you well, you know, generally speaking, uh, for those type of missions, you know, we were 28,000, 30,000 feet. I mean, so we were way up there. And how many people would be in the plane with you? Many people. Flying with you? Oh, we had uh, a, a five-man crew. Okay. Yeah. And what were their jobs? Uh, pilot, co-pilot, had navigator and radar navigator uh, downstairs. That really, truly, those were your bombardiers. And your pilot? That out. Yeah, electronic warfare officer and a, a gunner, and I said five or six. Okay. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was one crew. And we usually always flew together, the crew. Occasionally somebody would have a cold, couldn't fly or something, we'd mm -hmm. pick up a sub, but uh, not very often. So when you would fly, what would be your primary responsibility? I know it would change each time, but a typical flight up in the air, what would it be like? Well, when... When the B-52s flew, they would fly in waves. The wave was two cells, and one cell was three airplanes. And okay. they flew more or less in, uh, in trail. And you had a lead that would actually lead the other two to wherever your bombing target was going to be. And understand, we didn't just didn't drop one bomb and hit a target. We did carpet bombing. I mean, when we dropped bombs, we dropped a long string of bombs. And so we had our procedures of how we lined up, how we did that. And uh, that's part of the training we went through. We practiced it a lot. And that's what we did on each mission. As a matter of fact, uh, those, that, that portion of it was pretty standard. And, uh, and we all got, we got pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the difference is when you flew out of Guam to go over there, it was a 12-hour mission or refueling in between. You flew out of Okinawa, it was about an eight-hour mission. And when you flew out of Thailand, it was like, we loved it. It was, it was like two and a half hours. And yeah, that was marvelous for yeah. us. <laughs> so what was like the longest time you were ever in flight? In Vietnam, yes, sir. 12 hours. So what do you do up there for food? And you know, how do you go to the bathroom? How do you, what do you do? Yeah, well, it takes a lot of planning. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you when that. you were up there for 12 hours, we, you we knew take, it would be... uh, We'd take uh, box lunches. We'd call them flight lunches. Okay. And, uh, you know, it would be prepared for us before we went. Uh, the 
the airplane has relief facilities. Okay. Uh, it's uh, pretty Spartan mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. So uh, uh, on a 12-hour mission, sometimes uh, you know the pilots would swap off, and, you know, take a cat nap. Okay. You know, on the way like this, but not yeah. very often. You stayed strapped in the seat the whole time. So when you were up in the air, was there a time when your plane specifically ever got hit? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, okay. I was not involved in the Hanoi raids, which is where the B-52s uh, took a bunch of hits. As a matter of fact, after my three, my three tours over there, when I came back, I was sent up to the Pentagon to help plan the overall missions into Hanoi. So I planned those missions, but I didn't fly. Okay. And that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever witness any casualties or injury? Uh, well, we used to uh, we used to worry a lot about it uh, when we were bombing down in the uh, North and South Vietnamese border area, because we had the North Vietnamese then did have some fighters, and uh, what they usually would do, because we would have fighters with us too, and I usually didn't want to mess with our guys. And, but they would get down low, the Vietnamese would get down low, get up plenty of airspeed, and then pull straight up and try to come up to see if they could fire on a B-52. And uh, it didn't work very often. I had a guy do that to us one night and uh, uh, scared the bejesus out of us, I can mm -hmm. tell you that, because we looked up and wham, there's this guy up the afterburners going through, we didn't know he was there. And our fighters, uh, it was interesting because not long after that, we worked out uh, procedures so they could uh, protect us a little better. B a fighter, these were F-4s, flying behind a B-52, would be very slow. We'd have to say they were kind of hanging on the power curve back here because they're supposed to go really fast and we're kind of lumbering along up there. And so when the fighter came up on us and threw us like this, and these guys were down like this, now, so they had a light afterburner and get up speed and go in, you know, to get the uh, to protect us. Well, that that didn't work very well. So we worked out a procedure with them where they did, we call them figure S turns, where they would stay behind us, but instead of trying to stay with us, they fly like this. That way, they kept their airspeed up. So oh, if somebody okay. came up, they already had airspeed and they could go. They could, okay. Yeah, so we worked out. You know, it was always something developing and uh, working out uh, uh, tactics. So when you were in the air flying, um, would your gunner be using his gun a lot? Does that would make sense? Would the gunner do what? what was it, what's the gunner's responsibility? Well, he, uh, he, of course, he was there primarily for when you flew in a hostile environment. Did and you face a lot of hostile environments? Involved. Uh, well, of course, they were used in that environment when the force finally started going up to uh, Hanoi. Uh, matter of fact, a lot. Uh, we had some Vietnamese fighters were shot down by P-52 gunners, but not a whole bunch. And mm -hmm. after that, we finally decided that uh, uh, for the next model of airplane, that the gunner back in the tail really wasn't necessary. So we moved him up front with the rest of the crew. And uh, the, the uh, model that came after that, the H model that's out there now, took the gunner out completely. Because we just said it wasn't effective. Mm -hmm. So we took him out. Okay. But so they were back there and they could see what was going on and tell us what's happening behind us. So would you ever, you know, when you were up in the air, um, what would you be looking for as a pilot? Would you just be going on a route, or would you be trying to attack, or would you be on more of a defense? Well, most of what we did was on instruments, instruments and radar. Uh, the bombing procedure that we used mostly in Vietnam was ground controlled, called miscue sites. And uh, literally, you would contact the miscue site, they'd have the targets. You know, we'd all know what target we're going for. and. Uh, they would, they would actually de, de, uh, uh, give directions to the lead airplane. And it's almost like flying a GCA. Were you normally Some, the lead airplane? Was I? Ever the lead airplane? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I flew the lead a lot. And the other airplanes would uh, 
position himself by radar behind you, offset a little. So that when you finally began to drop the bombs, you know, you'd have a lead airplane here over here, and the next stream would be off here to the right, and the next stream would be off to the left, and you'd take a whole big area there and just cover it with uh, bombs. It was very effective. Very yeah, it was effective. Army. So then when you were done, you would just fly home? Or fly back to your base? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after those three months were over and you came back to the United States, uh -huh. where did you come back to? Uh, in my case, it was Carswell each time. Okay, is that what your family Fort was? Worth, yeah. And do you have kids? Do you have kids? <laughs> they. Do you have kids? Children? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. we have two girls. Okay, and have they been born yet? Uh, oh, one for all three and one for the last one, yeah. So the okay. two girls, yeah. And then how long were you in the United States for before you went back? Well, it depends. The first time between the two three month tours, we were only home, home three months. It wasn't planned that way, it just happened that way. Yeah. Were you and then ready we to get home back? about four months, maybe five, before we went back for six months. So. Okay. Were you ready to get back? Like you had a, like a mission that was unfinished, or were you. Well. Because the Vietnam War was a little different. Yeah, it was our wars. job. We were doing something. You right. weren't just planning and talking about it, you were actually out doing something. So mm -hmm. I guess we did kind of look forward to it. Um, I don't think the family did. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was difficult. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So then the second time you went back, yeah. where did you go? Same place? The, no, the second time I went back to Okinawa. Okay, that's what you said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you talked about you were in England and Spain and Morocco. Yeah, that was back in my early days. That was back in the B-47 days okay. when we used to pull uh, nuclear alert at these different countries. And uh, that, that's when I did that. That wasn't in the B-52s, that was in B-47s. Okay. And that was before Vietnam even started? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. way before. And way then, before. Is that, was that for training or was that for? No, we pulled, we would have flew up there with alert. That was real world alert. Okay. For instance, you know, I spent, uh, I took a special airplane over to Maroon, Spain, right smack in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So. <laughs> Oh, she is? Or he. Oh. I have never even talked to him. He's late, I guess. I guess he should have known it started well, at 3. I, I punched him in, so I guess he'll be here in a minute. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I'm, <laughs> Thank I'm, I'm you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah. Did he talk to her? Oh, no, sir. Oh, okay. I, I've never talked to this person, so I don't know what exactly they're doing, okay. but we'll yeah. just go along with what we're doing. Okay. Um, so... Let's talk about a little bit when you were in England and Spain. What was that for again? England specifically. In, uh, in uh, a B, a B-47s, it was called Reflex Alert. That was a whole operation that was called that. Okay. And uh, we had a lot of bases around the United States with B-47s at the time. And, uh, and I was at, at Little Rock Air Force Base at the time. And as a matter of fact, that's where we met, as a matter of fact, at Little Rock. Okay. And uh, uh, you would pull alert at home. And, but you also, the wing had responsibilities to put a certain number of airplanes on alert in England, Spain, North Africa, uh, primarily. Okay. And uh, so your time came around the cycle and you went to whichever one of the bases where your time came up for. And uh, so that's how we did that. Okay. Now that, that, was a little, that was a little more loose because we'd go over, we'd be on alert for a week, and then we'd be off for a week and then back on alert for a week before we came home. Okay. Yeah. So that was what you did with Spain and Morocco as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you like doing that? Uh, well, I don't know whether it necessarily was like. Well, did you appreciate, like? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it was. Like you felt well, like it was, sack, a, you thought it was purposeful to do it. And okay. uh, back in those days, uh, it was emphasized to you an awful lot that uh, how important that nuclear mission was, and uh, and you went through tests. My God, you went through more tests than you could possibly imagine, both written tests and flying tests and everything to make sure you could do everything perfectly, because there was a, there was a, no room for error whatsoever in the nuclear business. It was. A, Whenever you had special inspections or anything, mm -hmm. it wasn't you know, highly qualified, qualified, something like this. It was pass fail. And you wow. screwed up once, once and it was a fail. Yeah. You know, you didn't want to do that. 
Can you so talk? we worked out pretty hard. Can you talk about like the ranks throughout your time served? Talked about the the ranks that you achieved. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I was doing a crew duty. I was flying um, uh, on crews and everything for about really the first 13 years before I began to get off into staff assignments. And then finally, uh, now I'm off into B-52s. And the first staff assignment was at, uh, was at Omaha SAC headquarters, off at Air Force Base. And, uh, and I was doing operational tests and evaluation at the time. It's new weapons, testing them, seeing what works, what doesn't work. And from there I went up to, to sunny Grand Forks, North Dakota, where I was the operations officer for about three months and then was a squadron commander for a couple of years up there. Left there, went into the, uh, into the Pentagon and to work arms control issues, all the things in the world. What was that like? Well, that was a whole different world mm -hmm. <laughs> up there when you do that. And uh, uh, from that, I had a, a school assignment. By then, I was promoted, came back, was working on the joint staff for a while in the nuclear business once again, you know, and I'm kind of getting this nailed down as to what I want to do. And out of there, I was uh, moved out to uh, Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington, where I became wing commander. Okay. And I, being wing commander, I came back in and was the senior military advisor to the arms control uh, agency in the State Department. And that's quite a change when right. you do that. Yeah, Ambassador Ken Edelman was the, uh, was the head of it at the time. Enjoyed working for him very much was promoted there and then went up to be Air Division Commander at Pease Air Force Base. Okay. Then, which had three bases, at Pease, and we had uh, uh, Loring, Maine, over there in Plattsburgh, New York. All three of them closed now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I have no place to visit when I go back to it. So, uh, but did that and then got involved in the logistics business. And first of all, started out as vice commander at Sacramento, the McClellan Air Force Base, which is now closed, and then came over to Oklahoma City uh, as a vice commander and really and truly looking after modifications on B-52s, B-1s, and everything. It's back to stuff that I really knew how to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was it, and I retired from there. Okay, but your final, your highest position was Brigade General, correct? Yeah. Okay. One and, star. Okay. And that means you're above Colonel, correct? Yeah. Okay. And then when you were, you went back three times, right, to Vietnam? Yeah. So what was the third time like? Well, the third time, I, I went back over and and became the, uh, it, it was the 8th Air Force that ran it, the operation out there right now. 8th Air Force is now down in Barksdale. It's not the same thing at all. But uh, I became their standardization chief in which I would, in my crew, we would go out to all three of the bases and we would fly with crews to check number one to see if they're doing their job right. I mean, you know, you're dropping some pretty dangerous stuff right. there. You kind of want to make sure everybody knows what they're doing. But number two, to work out problems. You know, if there were operational problems, to be able to work it out. That's so this was I, less of, you know, flying and fighting, more of a managerial position. Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly, yeah. And how long were you there for? Six months. And then you came back to the United States? Came back to the United States. And yeah. then when you came back that last time, did you know that was going to be the last time? Last time, I, that's when I went up to the Pentagon and helped plan the Hanoi missions. What was the Hanoi mission? Uh, that was, boy, that was when the B-52s went up there and just waxed them. And that was when the North Vietnamese decided, this is in the Henry Kissinger Nixon days, they decided, you know, maybe we need to sue for peace. Yeah. And uh, so they did. That's really, truly what ended the war. But, I mean, it was, it was kind of wild. So when the war ended, you came back to, to this point, where was your family living? Well, well, most of that time they were at Carsville. And then after I did that, came back, we went to uh, Omaha. Okay. Yeah. And was it hard to readjust? back to living a civilian life? Well, I don't know if it wasn't necessarily for, uh, for us. Uh, both the daughters, the three or four times, told me that I completely ruined their entire lives. 
you know, had to leave all of their friends. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. They That's look teenage back girls at it. for you. <laughs> yeah, they look back at it now and say, you know, that was really pretty valuable to us because now we can go mix with anybody we have to right. because we learned how to do it the hard way. Exactly. Yeah, but they didn't think so at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so but when you came back, um, had the Vietnam already ended? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Almost, you know, it was still, we were still trying to get people out of there. It was uh, 72, and we were still trying to get people out of there, And uh, but the B-52s weren't bombing. Okay. Yeah. So did you ever suffer an injury when you were over there? Me? Not, no, not an injury to develop for that. Uh, you'll notice I have hearing aids, and that's from a lot of years around a lot of jet engines yeah. and, and not taking uh, care of my hearing. You know, so when you're in the engines, or when you're flying, Mm -hmm. Do you wear anything in your ears? Did you? You have a helmet. Right. Yeah, I have a normal that... helmet and uh, with the earpieces on. It holds it down, but I, I'll tell you, military airplanes are not known for their quietness. Right. <laughs> inside or out. So, uh, you know, there's always noise. So when you're in the airplane, who are you communicating with? When I'm in an airplane? Yeah, are you communicating with, you know, a general back on the ground? Or is that the radar person? Well, you know, I mean, we're communicating with right. people. That's what the headset is right. inside the... Uh, well, who are you exactly communicating with? Who was I? Communicating with? Who are you talking to? Well, oh, well, well, a lot of different people. You're talking about various control people. Uh, you're taking off. You're flying. You're talking to your other airplanes, particularly since you're all flying the uh, uh, same direction, same day. You know, make sure you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You talk to your tanker uh, when you had to do refueling. And uh, several of the places we'd had to do refueling out of Guam, we had to do some really heavy refueling to be able to make it. And then when you get over in country, you have to talk to the controlling authority, I'll call them that, uh, in the country that sort of handles airspace, who's where. I mean, yeah, we're in another country and everything, but we've got a war going on over here, and somebody's got to make sure everybody doesn't run into each other. Right. So we do that. Finally, we talked to that ground radar site that gave us the direction, you know, towards the target. And then the same thing when you're breaking out, you just reversed what you were doing going in. But uh, a pretty fair amount of radio communication. Okay. So speaking overall of your experience, how does this affect your life today? <laughs> well, um, you know, in the uh, when you're in the military and you're working that way, one of the things a lot of people like about it, a lot of people don't like about it, is your your life is pretty well laid out in what you have to do and whether you're going to be successful at it, and uh, uh, it's it's organized. You know, there's not much not much change once you start getting right. things going. You get kind of used to that. And we found out that when I retired, came out and started working in the business world, wasn't like that at all. And, you know, the first couple of times, you know, I got stung a few times until I said, not in the Air Force anymore. Yeah. I cannot count on this guy just right. saying he's going to do it. He's going to do it because he may not. Yeah. And so after I got stung a few times, I developed into something I could work with. So what kind of business adventures did you get into when you came back? Well, finally, uh, after uh, trying a couple of things that uh, I didn't like. How old were you I, at this point? I, when, I, when I retired? Yes, sir. Oh, well, what, that was 20-something years ago. I was 53, 54. Okay. And uh, uh, when we, uh, I got involved in the, it's called the BRAC business. Now, you're too young to remember BRAC. Uh, but it'll come up again. You'll hear about it again. And it was the Base Realignment and Closure Commission. And uh, there were a total of four of them where a commission actually determined after some study and hearings and whatnot what bases should be closed. It's probably the most efficient legislation in the, our Congress has ever passed because when the commission came in and said, this is it, you couldn't play with it. When it went to the Congress, it was an up or down vote. Yes, it's approved, or no, it's not approved. And so you run into a problem. Some guy that's a congressman, you know, has got a base in his backyard, mm -hmm. that's going to be on the closure list, he's not very happy. You know, he doesn't want it to close. But everybody else is saying, hey, 
put in my base. <laughs> it's, yeah. So it sounds good to me, and so they voted to clear it. So then communities began uh, to be aware that they were probably targeted in some areas, or, or could be, at least vulnerable. And so they really needed advice as you went along to this, of what can you do for this city, for this base, to kind of assure that it isn't going to come out on the closure list. Okay. And then if it does come out on the closure list, and you're going to have to put together a team to be able to argue it. It's almost like being in a court, you know, to be able to argue it why you should not. So uh, I got involved with that very early on, and uh, then uh, uh, decided I knew what I was doing here. People were kind of calling me and saying, you know, we want you to work for our city. So with that, I formed a company and uh, got outside people to come in, consultants with me that uh, know the business also. And so we did that for the next, God, what, eight years, I guess. And, and it was successful, and I enjoyed doing it. It threw me right back into the military business yeah. again. So you, didn't, you kind of gradually worked your way out of it. Yeah. 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 So what do you do now? Now that you're completely uh, retired? Well, uh, I started out uh, here. Once I got down here in Clemson, we moved down here, what, 12 years ago. So what brought you started, back to Clemson? Pardon me? What brought you back to Clemson? Uh, well, my wife's father was an old-time professor uh, here at Clemson in okay. agronomy, U.S. Jones. And my family in Spartanburg had been long since gone, so every time we got leave or vacation on active duty, we came to Clemson. You know, that's just what we did. So we knew an awful lot of people. Yeah. Between that and my uh, wife's parents' health at the time, we said we need to get on back down there. And we always knew we were going to come back here anyhow. We just came a little sooner than we had planned. And so once once we did that, we uh, and we knew so many people when we got here, we just said, well, this is it. We're going to stay right here where we are. And, uh, and, and we did. I became involved with the Military Officers Association. Uh, that's generally retired, doesn't have to be, but generally retired uh, officers. And I became the state president of it. Well, as things go, the, the position is, is term limited. So I got to the end of my term, and there was another guy that wanted to step into the position, so I dropped out, became the immediate past president. As soon as I did that, the Air Force Association people up here came up and said, you're free, we want you to be the state president of the Air Force Association. So I thought, well, what, I've been in the Air Force <laughs> Association for my whole life, I guess, but why not? So I took that one on for two years, and then I got asked to become the Air Force Association regional president. So I have three states, North and South Carolina and Georgia, and all the chapters under there. So what I have found that that has kept me a lot busier than I thought it would. <laughs> I bet. So, so what do you do on a daily basis for that? Well, we uh, uh, some of it's political, and that uh, you know we're trying to uh, each one will try to talk their congressional delegations into certain legislations that protects our health care. Uh, we in the Air Force Association look out very much for weapon systems, new airplanes, uh, and which which is badly needed now. Most of our airplanes are very, very old. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the other day, the B-52 that's flying, some guy mentioned, he says, you know, it's now eligible for AARP. It's over 50 years old. <laughs> and, uh, and then another guy came to me, we used to joke about, well, so-and-so used to fly them like this, and his son is now flying them. And one guy says, First guy tells the story, hadn't got a chance. He says, so and so over here, his, his grandson is now flying them. So, you know, they're very old airplanes, and so we work pretty hard in trying to develop the uh, connection between what politics and the industry so that we can get the new equipment and modernize the equipment that we've got. And uh, that turns out to be a pretty good job particularly nowadays. So what were the main lessons you took from being in the military? Uh, organization, for one thing for sure. Uh, to be able to uh, delegate responsibility. You, you can't do it all yourself. I don't care what you're doing. But, but, right. And then having that down as a, a 
as a target. To be able to select the right people to do the jobs that you're doing, and that's awfully important. You can't just, I don't like so and so, so let him do this, because he may not have any idea what that right. is. And so you know, be very careful about who you selected to do various jobs. And I think in the military, you were really careful about it uh, because it got pretty dangerous. You got the wrong person out there. So I, I think organization and learning to work with people and select people were what uh, I learned in the military. So a little bit more specific questions. Yeah. Uh, was there a dangerous situation you were ever in that you really thought, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to come out of this? Yeah, there have been a few aircraft emergencies that you happen. Uh, some of them are, I don't know, I'm thinking about a kind of technical, think of one that we flew, and the early B-52s had these huge drop tanks, gas tanks out on the wing, combination of reasons, not just fuel, but for stabilization. And uh, I can recall once we got out on a mission and one of the drop tanks wouldn't feed. Now that's serious, because you've got a little over 20,000 pounds sitting out there on this wing, and you're burning fuel down and everything, you're going to get to the point where this is not too good. And uh, we had to find a place to put it down, and uh, which, which we did. And uh, that got a little hairy. The other one was, which is one I've always loved about, we came back from a, a mission into Utapau, and I was a cell lead, three ship cell. And my number two guy called me on his, his emergency radio. It's one to send the survival pack. Call me on this emergency radio. Oh, what's this? He's got a radio like this. And he says, they've lost all power, electrical power. And he says, you know, they're just barely able to keep the thing going. It has no flight instruments at all. And the weather over there was monsoon season, and it was atrocious. And so the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to get him a tanker, because we didn't come back with a whole lot of fuel from those missions. And uh, but all of the tankers that were airborne that day had, uh, had probe and drove, we call it. It didn't have a boom. It had a basket because they were refueling Navy airplanes. And we don't do baskets, so we didn't have anything. So we were going to figure out some way to get him down. And we uh, practiced flying formation for a while. And we found out very early what other people had told us. When you're trying to fly very big airplanes in standard formation, it doesn't work very well. Number one, the big airplane doesn't respond quickly. But number two, when you begin to get into weather, you are so far away from the other yeah. airplane you can't see. Him. <laughs> so we decided well, we're going to have to play like a, like play like I'm a tanker. And uh, he got up behind me. We practiced for a while, and he got up very very close behind me. And uh, we put like that, and we configured the airplane and brought it down to uh, through the clouds. And uh, he was just tucked up behind us. As a matter of fact, my gunner was just screaming most of the time. He's saying, you know, if I could open my window back here, I could shake hands with that bling. <laughs> close. Wow. I said, well, yeah, that's the point. And when we broke out, a guy on the ground said, when we came out of the office, the ceiling was about 200 feet. And he said, when we broke out of that, <laughs> that overcast with the two airplanes, he said it was an aluminum overcast. He said he'd never seen anything like it at all. So then, you know, I poured the coals and went around, and he landed out of the thing. And uh, we did a lot of celebrating at the club that oh, night. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have a memorable experience, I don't know, with a soldier or, you know, that was below you? Did you have to discipline, discipline them a lot? Did, did I? Discipline them? I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Anna. Or, you know, the question is, like, did you have a memorable experience with someone that you had to discipline? Or, you know, did someone step out of line since you were the general? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you had other times you have to do that, too. And uh, my uh, daughter, who graduated from uh, Duke, and she was on Air Force scholarship, for instance, and she ran into one of those things that was typical. Uh, she became an intelligence officer uh, down at a base in Texas. It's closed now. And the particular... Uh, particular squadron that she was in charge of down there. You know, she was a brown bar, second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had never passed one of their operational readiness inspections. Now, that's bad. And so, uh, you know, I was a general, and I was up in California, and she's down here in Texas. 
And so she calls me one night just practically in tears. And I said, well, Ann, what's wrong? She said, well, I've got this master sergeant who works for me. And he says, and he is countering every instruction that I give. And he says, and she says, and we're in a mess right now. And I says, I ain't countering. She said, well, what am I supposed to do? And I said, you go in there and you take that guy, you put your finger in his chest and you back him up against the wall and you tell him what's going to happen the next time he does that, that he's going to be so far out in left field, you know, <laughs> he can forget anything if he's allowed to stay in the service. And so the next day she called me, she says, Dad, I says, yeah, she's worked. We passed. <laughs> that is best, right? We passed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what did you? So she met her husband there too. They okay. Were right there, so. so did she want to get into the Air Force because of you? I bet. She uh, Anne enjoyed her time in the Air Force very much, but when she got married and uh, just almost right away, the first uh, grandson was born, mm -hmm. and uh, she she locked on to that's being her job. Yeah. Being a mom, and so. Uh, with other story not worth going into like this. They both ended up getting out. He's an American airline pilot. Okay. He was a lawyer on the side. And she is taking care of the kids. Okay. And they've done pretty well. You know, one yeah. of them's 22 now, and uh, the other one's, what, 19. Oh, wow. So what about your other daughter? Uh, she lives over here in Darlington, okay. as a matter of fact, yeah. And she uh, she's a Clemson graduate. Okay. Her husband's a Clemson graduate, and uh, they sort of operate a family farm over in the Darlington area. Uh, my uh, daughter now is a, uh, oh, an administrative assistant of some kind at, uh, at uh, Florence, uh, Florence Darling Technical College. And he is uh, actually, you know, I don't know what the title is. He's uh, a Clemson, uh, works for Clemson, and what did he call the title? I used to call him the district agriculture guy, and that's okay. that's what he does. And he's got five counties, four or five counties under him over there on that side. But they're in Darlington, so we see them, see them fairly yeah. frequently. Okay. Yeah. I think that's all the questions I have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you well, so kind much. Of fun. Yeah, you, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. No. Good. Come up and say hey. How's it going? I'm Nathan. Yeah, Nathan.